Okay, folks, welcome to another episode of Farm Like a Hero. I'm Richard Perkins. Today, I've got a very special guest, Mr. Charles Dowding, who I'm sure you already know of through YouTube as an author and educator. And I'm super excited to hear a bit more of Charles's past and how he initially got into farming in the first place. He's been farming for several decades now. And then I'd like to geek out on everything about No Dig. So, Charles, thanks so much for taking the time and being with us today. It's a pleasure, Richard. Yeah, I only wish we could be in the same room together, but there you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd love to go back to, to the beginning, maybe even to your childhood, Charles, if, you, if you're prepared to talk a bit about where you grew up and where your first influences in farming came from. I, I grew up on, on a dairy farm, um, just six miles from here, and my family were, my father was a very hardworking dairy farmer, but he was quite a bit older than me. He was a late marriage perhaps thanks to Second World War and all that. And so he was 55 when I was born and I didn't get to know him that well. I just knew that he was always busy on the farm <laughs> and I would go out and help in the summer months mainly. So I, I, I was protected from that almost. It was like, I don't, he didn't want me to go into farming. In fact, um, I think I, of the three kids, I was seen as the one who might have a, um, a career and some proper money in. <laughs> okay. To, you know, I was more academic type and um obviously it didn't work out like that but i did enjoy farm work in the summer holidays and that was my first experience of it and i also remember working in my mother's kitchen garden picking raspberries and that kind of thing but it was very gentle uh, i wasn't full on outside very much actually interesting and did you go like maybe you could talk about when you became like an independent adult did you go off into other works and career before you came back to farming yeah, no, what happened was, I mean, I can, with benefit of hindsight, you can sort of see it more clearly how the, the thread was running. But I, while I was at university at Cambridge, I really enjoyed that. That was the only bit of education I actually enjoyed was something at university. And um, I came across a book. Someone recommended this book by Professor Peter Stringer, who's an Australian, and he was, it was called Animal Rights. And it's about animal treatment in farming. And, and having grown up on a farm and dairy cows and all that kind of thing and and reading this book was like wow it was a bit of a eureka moment and and i became vegetarian just like that and mm -hmm. so this was 1979 when vegetarianism was pretty marginal and all the people in the in, in the college you know where i was in the college kitchens gave me funny looks and the chef was like, oh god it's that vegetarian again <laughs> but um you know i felt it felt right and and from that led me into just looking outside more and thinking about things differently because you know in the 70s things like battery farming were totally taken for granted and, and nobody was too worried about it well not nobody but it wasn't a concern it is now in many places so mm. um, yeah this was all a bit radical and revolutionary and then i discovered um the soil association so i joined the soil association in 1981 and my friends just took the make no end yeah the soil association <laughs> <laughs> and uh that, that got me into, you know, thinking about organic and being, being on a farm, um, it didn't dawn on me immediately that I could do this myself. It just felt too big a step because my training was not in horticultural farming. And for that, I'm really grateful actually, because it, it meant I came at it from a bit outside and not from inside the profession, so to speak. And I hadn't learned mm -hmm. about things like say rotation or whatever it might be, all these <laughs> classic things. Yeah, yeah. So when I started, um, which happened because I went to a in, in, in um, year after university, I came down and I just didn't know what to do. And, and I just knew that I didn't want to do all these office jobs and things that were being proposed. So I found some farm work in a Wales, uh, just as a volunteer on a, um, a organic market garden. In the early eighties, organic was revolutionary. You know, it wasn't anything like as accepted as it is now. Mm. It was seen as great radical and left wing and and i was working on this place and a really nice guy called charlie wager special place and he he gave me the confidence he said you know you you could do this why don't you become an organic market gardener um i wasn't sure myself but anyway yeah he he sparked the, the feeling that i could do it and so that that was in like may and by september i was already starting my market garden at, at home so i was lucky enough you know i had the land there Mm. And and the the shock bit is the horror is that I borrowed the farm rotavator to, <laughs> to rotate the pasture. This was my first step because I didn't know any other way. Uh, so I rotated the ground and um, shaped up my beds. 
But before I got into road racing, actually, I don't know if any of your listeners might know, there's something called the Kemink system. K-E-M-I-N-C-K, it's a German guy in the 80s, and he, it was a sort of ridging, aerating, lifting tool. And um, I had a friend in Somerset who was using that to, he said you could break up the grass with it. And I tried that and it wasn't working, basically. My father came out one afternoon and he said, what are you doing? You just get the rotor weight inside. <laughs> it was almost the only time he actually gave me any advice about anything, really. He was, he was Because he was very, quite remote in many ways. Mm. And um, as it happens, it was good advice. So it's kind of ironic, I know, because I'm now no dig. But th- th- at that point, the rotor weight was very useful to, <laughs> to give me clean ground. And uh, mm-hmm. I shaped up beds, an uh, acre and a half with a spade. I made an acre and a half of, of raised beds, just shoveling soil out from path to bed. And, mm. and then I packed on from there. I want to just go back to that. What was it you actually studied at Cambridge? Uh, geography. Geography. And did you at that point feel like you might go, like, did you have a idea in mind what you might be doing at that point? None whatsoever. No, I, I think I was <laughs> sure, actually, if truth be told. I, I really hadn't thought, well, nothing had, nothing had come at me. And um, I, I can now see this was my right path. But at the time, it, it seemed so weird or impossible that I didn't think no. <laughs> hmm. I wonder then, so you started a, an acre and a half, what's that, 6,000 square meters of bed, that's, that's quite a yeah. lot to manage, was that a steep learning curve for you? Yeah it was, yeah the first year was, um, I made a few mistakes, The probably the biggest mistake I made actually was, I'd also read one of my um, people who inspired me is Ruth Stout, mm. um, you must know who he did the hay mulching and I bought a load of old hay because I thought this clearly works for her I'll mulch with hay because what I'd seen before that I'd gone the way I taught myself was looking at what other people were doing and I think that I'd recommend that to anybody I think you can learn more by going and seeing a working market garden than probably from two weeks in a college because you know if you're really open to understanding and ask questions and and I saw a lot a lot of what I consider were not brilliant methods mainly with weeds I just saw so many weeds and I, I just thought no they, they were spending so much time weeding so I thought mm-hmm. it's got to be a better way and so I was really focused on that more than anything and the hay marching seemed logical <laughs> clearly stops the weeds growing but then roost out I've since realized doesn't have slugs <laughs> so okay. you know, uh, dry climate in Connecticut and we do so with my hay marches I was getting a lot of slug damage to my new plantings the following spring so that's where I started, you know, I still wanted to be no dig, but compost mulch in, in our climate. <clears throat> so you started out with cultivation, but then mulching and covering the soil and, and working like that. But when did yeah. you actually first transition over to just laying down compost as the mulch? Do you know, not at all in the 1980s. It's, you know, although I was no dig from the, the initial motivation, because it was just there and I hadn't really thought about why it, would be better not to or what way I could use to kill the grass so I just carried on doing that and I think the first time I did um, say cardboard and compost wasn't until 2008 so mm. fairly recently actually. but I've always been no dig you know as the second phase if you like yeah uh, once once I got the bare ground um, I just hadn't taken it that step further back how long were you running that farm when uh, you were seven years 83 to 90 um, and what was the state of the because you were talking about like were you working to organic standards Have yeah I, um, I got the organic symbol of soil association in 1984 and it wasn't quite as strict looking back on it as it is now uh, we were just given a once over quite casually really once a year that was the symbol in 1984 mm. and that did help me to sell like I was selling quite a bit to London and um, supermarkets even. Um, there was a growers cooperative in 1986 in Somerset. Um, we were selling to um, big supermarkets and a lot of us got our fingers burnt with that. Um, mm. and, and to shops in London as well. But in, in the 80s, there was a real shortage of organic food. It was still very small and there, there, weren't, there weren't enough growers to meet the growing demand even then. So selling actually wasn't a problem. And it was amazing how I didn't have a marketing plan, but Nearly every time I had a crop ready, the phone seemed to ring. Someone wanted something, so you know it just worked really well. Was that wholesaling most of the products? Yeah, it was a lot of wholesaling, and you know the wholesaling. I realised after a while that I just wasn't making enough money. 
you know, the, well, you know all this, it's like, some of your listeners might not, but the price of vegetables is, in real terms, even in the 1980s, it was higher than now, actually. You know, I, I could do on, by, by 1986, I was cropping seven and a half acres, so that's two and a half hectares, I think, no, two hectares, no, wait a minute, three hectares, um, all no dig raised beds, so that was a lot of time. I reckon that one person could manage one and a half acres or 6,000 square meters, that was my calculation at that time, for um, field vegetables, I would call it, rather than what I'm doing now, more, which is much more intensive, small yeah. scale, high value. So I was growing in the 1980s things like sweet corn, uh, red and white cabbage, um, celeriac, thing, onions for sale, leeks, parsnips, what I would call more field crops that you can yeah. mechanize. And so, but the prices were just about high enough, um, but only just. And by the time you go wholesale and like with supermarkets, I one load of lettuce I sent off, a um, fan load of lettuce, and the phone call came two days later. Sorry, we just had to reject all of that because we found a slug. And the leaks went off, and then the phone call came back. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Dynam, your leaks, they're too long. We can't use them. You, know, you don't need many such phone calls to really realize there has to be a better way than this. Those guys have got too much power, you know. they. Yeah. They, they can just call all the shots. So it was actually in 1989, finally, I um, started a market store in the local town and developed a box scheme. I started doing boxes in 1983, actually, did six a week, did 10 a week by 1984. You know, I was one of the first doing that. <clears throat> and it, it grew only slowly because people weren't used to the idea, but it did start to catch on. And by 1989, we were doing around 180, 100 boxes a week. So that became my mainstay by that stage. 